You see, it's hard to tell what exactly was the very first stimulus which got me to the foundations because it's whenever you get in touch with these items, you get fascinated. And it's more a process than an actual personal problem which brought me there. Of course, that initially it was the strangeness of the atom and how the atom is getting formed and the way in which the electrons come, the empirical rules which I learned in the school. Then understanding that beyond them there is something which explains or at least tried to explain, tried to, well, fascinated me in the beginning. Then of course uh, it continued with the Dirac equation which showed that understanding the nature and trying to understand it at a deeper level actually brings you to explain unexplained features like predictions, if one wants to say so, of the antimatter. Then of course that understanding the world and the weirdness of the world, it's absolutely fascinating. Then my interest became, I dare say, saying a bit more professional when I started to do experiments challenging some of the features of the quantum mechanics. In particular one which I'm working right now, it exactly br brings me to the initial uh, feature which brought me to the quantum mechanics. It's the Pauli exclusion principle. So we are now, uh, I mean, uh, leading a collaboration uh, which is trying to measure a possible violation of this principle. So the way that the nature, it's somehow stranger than we believe and we have this theory which is the best we can have to explain it at a microscopic level, quantum mechanics, it's really, really a big fascinating feature for me. So this is more or less how, how it all started and of course one can talk forever about the many interesting features which are not yet resolved, otherwise we wouldn't be here still discussing about this. So there is still plenty of space for people young like you and for everybody else who is extremely young and uh, ready to do things in, in life and uh, there is an old territory to conquer. That's something which I cannot tell because quantum mechanics it's a theory which has a clear apparatus, mathematical apparatus, which calculates things. So one do not really doubt about the fact that quantum mechanics describes the reality and the things which we are measuring in our experiments. Then what does it mean? It's completely another feature or, well, it's the same feature seen from another point of view. Which one comes closer to, to my view, it's, well, it's still, it's still a problem. I'm I'm commuting sometimes from one view to another view because let's say uh, there, are, there are many. We are discussing uh, basically three or four more often like the Bohmian, the potential collapse, which is not actually quantum mechanics but claims that it modifies the quantum mechanics, the fascinating many world, even many brains. I mean, there are many, many others. And uh, what I believe personally is that this proves that in spite of the hundred years of quantum mechanics, we should not forget that in 2013 we celebrate hundred years since Niels Bohr actually formulated his empirical rules which started a vast territory of quantum mechanics. So it's still the fact that we are still struggling to understand it might mean that we are not yet there. So maybe the theory which is my favorite, it's not yet there. And I like to believe this because this means that uh, there is still a lot of things to do and a lot of challenges to face. Not only for, I'm an experimentalist, so not only for experimental people who are hoping to, to get either by a dedicated experiment or by serendipity, which is uh, so often paid in the uh, past. It's uh, to, get, to get a bit farther and to check and to understand which is the real theory, if we will be able to in some future, which stays beyond or maybe even inside in, in the quantum mechanics, which we are facing at since almost 100 years.
Well, that's a question which myself I asked many times. And uh, personally, I arrived at the conclusion that it could be special in quantum mechanics. It's not yet obvious it really is, but with respect to whatever we might consider in our daily life as being randomness, which is actually a lack, lack of knowledge. I don't know the things that they pop up, but if I would just know them, I would be able to do a clear predictions. What seemed to be the case in quantum mechanics, and that's the main difference of why the role of randomness might be special, is that there is no way and no knowledge you could achieve at the fundamental, microscopic or whatsoever level, which might bring you in the situation that you could predict the exact outcome of an experiment. And this makes so that if that's the case, uh, the role of randomness in quantum mechanics would be indeed special and might have implications which are not only uh, remaining closed into a room where we discuss those who are aiming for foundation, but might have had a fundamental role in the evolution of the universe. Because initially the universe, when we go back to the Big Bang, was, was a quantum universe. So whatever we learn about quantum, randomness and so on, it reflects back to the history of wha what we came, how we came here. So randomness might have brought us here somehow or might guide the future of our universe. So it's a question which has not only a philosophical or, well, foundation uh, implication, but might have practical, concrete, concrete effect in, uh, in the evolution of, of the history of the universe and of ourselves and of the things uh, in the experimental and technologies which we might use or we are actually using right now. I think that there are very, very few other situations in which the implications of a, of a theory were so shocking for the community. And the Bell inequalities are extremely valuable because they put in contact the foundations and the way to see the world, whether quantum, not quantum, or, well, whatsoever, locality and uh, randomness, which we spoke before, whether this it's, it put in contact the aim, the realm of foundation with the possibility to really check it. So the fact that we could really measure how the world is it's absolutely fantastic. Then the output was not at all granted. The fact that in the end we discovered that the world behaves in such a way that the Bell inequalities are violated, it's, it's teaching a lesson which we didn't yet end to learn. So we are still discussing, debating with misunderstandings, with even, let's say, fightings among us, whether we, we really, what we measured, it's what we sought to have measured and about the meaning, of course, the word non-locality, it's the easiest one to, to match with the Bell inequalities. But there are some others, even crazy ones like conspiracy, the fact that some, somehow we got to measure that because somebody or something is conspiring. Of course, I don't take this seriously but it's still in the realm of, uh, of verification. And what is even more interesting is that we have checked this at all level we were able to check, both with photons which do not have a mass and with particles which are more massive. And we are still continuing to check this, slowly, slowly eliminating all the so-called loopholes which might leave a, even if a small window to some doubt that what we think the Bell inequalities mean non-locality in particular might really mean. So it's a lesson which we are still, still, still trying to, to understand better and better. Not only to understand, but to use as well. Because the quantum technologies, which are absolutely relying on quantum features, are still uh, in development phase, but are making huge promises, like quantum computation, cryptography, teleportation and whatever else. They are relying in the end on features which are Bell inequalities and all the apparatus, if I am allowed to say so, of the quantum mechanics.
Well, I, I want to start by a joke. When uh, Feynman was, thought, was, was asked what's the role of philosophy in physics, he was answering that the role of philosophy is similar to the ornithology for birds. Well, of course, that's a very bad and harsh joke. Philosophers actually answered to him that if the birds would only be able to understand ornithology, this might, might bring them a big help. So having said this, it's clear that the role of philosophy, it's, it's absolutely important. So it gives an instrument and a way to better understand the world, to better understand, allow me to use this word with somebody, it's some, sometimes it's, uh, well, not nice to use because it might mean many things, reality. And by this point of view, it's not, a, not, it's not randomly that physicists are becoming, some of them, philosophers, and uh, some philosophers are well-trained in physics. So there are two ways, two complementary ways, or let's say two modalities, to really understand what is out there. And the society should invest on both, because uh, the knowledge and the capacity to, to, you never know. So philosophy, it's of big help to understand what's in the universe. Of course, it's not the only instrument. Philosophy without instruments uh, like experimental physics and the theoretical physics would not go too far. But uh, one together with the other, with a border between them, which uh, it's not sharp, it's moving actually because some of the items we are discussing as physicists are items which philosophers are discussing too. So I see them um, not as ornithology for the birds, but let's say as a kind of a natural zoology in which we are both creatures of the knowledge. I think that there are many pressing questions. Some of them are old ones, are always the same. So understanding whether one of the interpretation of the quantum mechanics, well, one of the theories of quantum mechanics, can definitely defeat the others and become the quantum mechanics. Beyond this, uh, what I believe it's important altogether is to understand whether there is a theory beyond quantum mechanics. And since today there are some uh, models like collapse theories which are claiming that uh, they are effective models for a theory which we yet don't know but might be there and might replace in a future quantum mechanics as the relativity replaced the Newtonian uh, gravi gravity, it's something which might be a pressing question if we are able to check possible signals of this uh, theory which uh, makes out of the present quantum mechanics a uh, particular case. Beyond this, other pressing questions, at least in my view, are questions related with uh, what we don't understand, not necessary only in the broad, uh, in the sense of present quantum mechanics, but going beyond. Like uh, I, I only mentioned two, two things, one which is obvious, I'm not going to comment any farther, like quantum gravity. This is uh, probably everybody speaks about quantum gravity. But the second item, it's let's say the dark energy problem. So the vacuum energy, whether there is somehow this uh, hidden problem of quantum mechanics, the fact that uh, we should have in principle a huge energy out there, we don't have it but instead we have something which we call dark energy, which might or might be not related with quantum fluctuations. It's something which needs, needs a solution and it can only come from a deeper and more profound understanding of the quantum mechanics. Then there are many, many others, but uh, I would stop for these two, thinking that that's already a whole territory to be explored for whomever might be fascinating. Personally, I believe everybody who understands a little is fascinated. <laughs>